Well, uh, like most writers, I'm terrible with titles. So as I was working out my notes for today and, and the theme for today, um, the first thing I did is I just stole the title off this flyer. So I had the importance of place written down at the top of my page. And then as I started working on it, I, I changed the title to the hyper-specificity of place. Because I was thinking about the way we define ourselves. And finally, I came to the conclusion that the title was The Desperation of Place. Um, which sounds like I'm about to bring it down, but that's not true. Um, I was thinking about this um, this week because uh, Cleveland Magazine asked me to, um, to write a piece about the weird, uh, I guess, rivalry um, between Akron and Cleveland. Um, a, a thing that some of us understand and then people in, anywhere else don't understand at all. And it drew me to, um, it's weird because when uh, I mentioned to my wife what I was going to be, where I was going to be speaking today, and I said, it's this transportation thing, she said, what do you know about transportation? Um, and I said, nothing, but one of my catchphrases about the, the desperation of place is that it's, it's uh, 35 minutes from Akron to Cleveland, but it's two hours from Cleveland to Akron. <laughs> I told that joke uh, in Stark County this week, and they laughed. Thank goodness. But one guy raised his hand and he said, I don't get it, um, but I'm from North Canton. <laughs> that is the hyper-specificity of place. Um, it's, it's a joke, we understand it. We know that there's this weird rivalry. It's almost like um, Canada and the United States between Akron and Cleveland, where we're, we're as alike as two places could be, and yet super aware of our differences. Um, and, and it's how we define ourselves in a way. In a way, I think it's a healthy thing. Um, although we don't like being treated like Cleveland's little brother, we love the idea that we can define ourselves separately from a place that we know understands us probably better than anybody else. And I think that's born of um, a theme that I've been thinking about and writing about for the past number of years, and really kind of in a way for the whole time I've been writing. Um, it's, it's born of not just the place I come from, unlike uh, Josh McManus, I've only lived in one place. And the benefit of that is that I've been able to understand it not just as a place, but also of my time. It changes. Um, people and places change over time. And the place I came from um, when I came of age in the 1970s and 80s is a place that felt like the middle of nowhere. Um, this was before the internet and after the collapse of our sort of defining personality um, up until just about the time I became aware of where I lived. Akron was known as the rubber capital of the world and, and that was an easy identity. You could go anywhere and people would understand what that was. And I sort of became aware of my place just as that was disappearing. And this desperation of identity was beginning. Who are we? What are we? And it felt like a void. Was, we, we weren't connected digitally the way we are now. Um, strangely, Akron was one of the first places in the country, though, to have cable television. And you would think that would make us seem like pioneers or um, like somehow like connected in an early way. But I think, in retrospect, Actually, I think the rest of the world said they're lost there in the wasteland, the post-industrial wasteland of Northeast Ohio. We need to give them something. <laughs> so we'll give them MTV. Um, but it did. It felt like the middle of nowhere. And I think, you know, having looked back and thought about this, we become tied to the hyper-specificity of place in a way that drives us toward the desperation of place. Um, some of you know Akron claims to be the birthplace of the hamburger. Do you know that? Yeah. Have you told people you know Akron is the birthplace of the hamburger? <laughs> Good. Because it's a stupid thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we do it. You can go to a website right now by a local hamburger maker that has information on how Akron invented the hamburger. Hamburg, New York, Athens, Texas, New Haven, Connecticut, and Seymour, Wisconsin also claim to be the birthplace of the hamburger. And if you research the story as I've done, because I'm a geek, 
uh, you find that the stories are almost identical. In each place, it's like, oh, it was during the county fair in 1913, and uh, two local brothers were running a stand, and they ran out of meat. And so they said to the next stand, the guy who was selling sausages, would you grind up some of that meat and we'll form it into some sort of a patty and cook it on this grill that we have and we'll serve them and we'll call them, oh, I don't know, hamburgers. <laughs> it's, nobody invented a hamburger. It's, it's always been here. Akron, um, you may have seen this week that um, the Converse Shoe Company is uh, suing some other retailers who are making shoes that look uh, uncomfortably like the Chuck Taylor sneaker. Congress is very proud of its iconic Chuck Taylor all-star sneaker. Akron, at least some Akronites, including myself, claim that the Chuck Taylor sneaker would not exist if it weren't for Akron. That's because there was an actual Chuck Taylor who came to Akron in the uh, early part of the 20th century and got uh, onto one of the industrial teams, the Firestone Non-Skids, the only sports team ever named after a car tire. Um, and he, if you parse the history, it appears that he really wasn't much of a player, but he happened to make one key shot in an important game, and the local newspaper, the Akron Times Press, uh, wrote a story, you know, Chuck Taylor makes a big shot, you know, um, it's, a, it's a big deal. And because there was no mass media, Chuck Taylor, a very not much of a basketball player, but a very savvy marketer, um, instead of coming back to play for the non-skids the next year, he moved to Detroit and he took his newspaper clipping with him and he said, I'm a star basketball player. Look, it was in the Akron Times Press. And because he was able to sell himself, he got on, onto another team in Detroit and soon the Converse Shoe Company came calling and they said, we need a star basketball player to run our basketball clinics so we can sell these shoes that we're developing as basketball shoes. And Chuck Taylor said, well, I'm a star basketball player. Look, it was in the Akron Times Press. <laughs> and it got this sense, it started to sort of barnstorm around the country running these basketball camps and became a star marketer. And so when the Converse Shoe Company um, w was gonna sort of rebrand the shoe, they said, Chuck Taylor, you're such a good marketer, we're gonna put your name on the side of our shoe and he, thereby, he became the only person in the history of American culture to have an endorsement deal, not because of his, he was a sports star, but because of he was a marketing star. And so, you know, that's a neat story, but those of us who have a desperation of place, therefore say, the Converse All-Star comes from Akron, Ohio. <laughs> because this is what we do. You can extra extrapolate that all the way up through this great saga of LeBron James. Um, you know, once once you get into this void, once you get into this um, desperation to redefine yourself, you're looking for the, the new icon, the new rubber capital of the world, the easy identity. And so when LeBron James, of course, went became not only the home grown hero, but also played for the home team, the Cavaliers, it, it's, it's easy to understand in a unique way here why his departure was so devastating and why we took it so personally and almost as um, in, in a way that was shamed, that we felt shamed by his departure. It, and I think people in the country never quite understood that and never could quite understand it as uniquely as people who are from here who understand that it's 35 minutes from Akron to Cleveland and two hours from Cleveland to Akron. And so his return is remarkable. If you read that letter in Sports Illustrated, it's not just that he's coming back to play for the hometown team, and it's not even just that he's coming back home, but he said, essentially, I need to go back to my hometown because it's where we do things the hard way on purpose. He, he said, I need to go back there because it's the one place where I feel like I belong and the one place where I understand we do have to fight harder in a certain way. When he, you know, excuse me, Josh, for using a profanity, but one thing that we have here in a place that is so hyper-specific about its identity is we have a really good bullshit detector. And some people, I think, cynically suggested when they read that letter that um, 
that you know he was just saying what it, we wanted to hear, and he was just he was marketing himself. But if you read that letter, you can hear he really understands where he comes from. He really understands who he is, and thereby who we are um, in a way that's meaningful. And so it would seem superficial to hitch your wagon of identity to a sports celebrity, but there is very little about that story that is actually superficial. It has a much deeper meaning. Um, but we do, we cling to these things, large and small, the hamburger. You know, um, to, just to play once again off of Josh's uh, use of profanity, I can't believe he did that in a room full of suits, but he did. Um, <laughs> do you remember, uh, just, it was this year, um, this report came out that somehow um, somebody had figured out that um, Northeast Ohio was the most swearing community in America, and which, and what did we do immediately? We were proud of it. Because <laughs> we never get to be the best at anything, so we're, we're the best at cussing, okay, we'll take it. It's true. There was um, one of those, those idiotic reports came out um, this year. It was, uh, where it's, it, it's one of these rankings, and it was the, uh, it was this um, Gallup poll partnered with this health organization to find um, this, this, the state, ranked the 50 states in order of their well-being. It was the well-being index. And the USA Today got a hold of the report, and instead they flipped it. So instead of the, the, the most the states with the greatest sense of well-being, it was the 10 most miserable states in America. And I knew, as soon as I saw the report, I knew where it is, let's see where it is. And, um, and Ohio was, uh, by the, the, that definition, Ohio was the third most miserable place in America. And I was upset, I was pissed, because I wanted to be first. I was going to actually call West Virginia and just ask them if they would want to trade spots. Because that's what we do. We, we, that's, and that's born, I think, again, of the time and place I came from, is, is that you'll take anything. And, um, and that might seem like a bad thing or a negative way of looking, but I don't think it is. It's, it's you become groomed in a way, in a really deeply ingrained way, for somebody like me who's never left here, to be attuned to these things that ultimately become authenticity, what Josh mentioned earlier. It feels real when you're in a place like this that understands that joke that I told. Um, it feels real to be in a place that you know is the only place in the world where the good, it, good your blimp doesn't fly over the Super Bowl, it flies over your house on a Tuesday afternoon. And we, that's one of our icons. It's, you know, there's a blimp there. We use it all the time as one of the things that we own that you need. Many of you know that there was a new Goodyear blimp launched this year with new technology and it was a you know, really shining example of our progress. But those of us who are from here have a problem with it. You can't hear it. It's, it's, been, it's been advanced technologically in such a way that you don't hear that drone. And for anybody who grew up here, you know what you did as a child is as soon as you heard that distinct drone, you all know what it sounds like, you ran outside and you looked up in the air. And what most of us will admit is that right up until this new blimp launched, as middle-aged adults, you heard that drone and you ran outside and you looked up in the air. Because it's one of the things that we do, one of the things that we understand. So I'm actually going to read you a story, um, a very a, a short essay from, from my book um, that goes to that very sense of, you know, who are we and how are we um, the way that we are. And this is, a, this is an essay that, um, that took place when I was a teenager. Um, just becoming aware of where I was from and of the fact that I associated in some way um, with the place I was from, but um, still too naive and unsophisticated to understand exactly what that meant. It's called 8675309, a love song. Sometimes, my home really did feel like the middle of nowhere, or more accurately, and worse, like a confounding void in the middle of somewhere. Everything of note that came from Akron was literally from Akron. If it became known, 
It was almost a given that it no longer existed here. Devo, transplanted to Los Angeles, referred derisively to their Ohio hometown as a good place to be from. Chrissy Hine, expatriated to England, wrote her long distance ode to Akron. My city was gone. Even Firestone, one of the city's signature corporations, motto, the name that's known as Firestone, moved its headquarters away, and not once, but twice, first to Chicago, then back to Akron, then to Nashville, all within four years, as though to underscore and amplify its departure. It seemed that if anything had potential, it left. It began to seem necessary, the only option. Half my high school class was gone by the end of graduation summer, and the others trickled away one after the next, after the next. And conversely, everything of interest came conspicuously from elsewhere. Whatever we saw on television or heard on the radio or read in a magazine came from another place and almost always the big cultural centers, New York or Los Angeles or occasionally Canada, which made us seem even more disconnected. So it was with considerable interest in the summer of 1982 that I heard this harmonized chorus, a song, a hit on the radio by the band Tommy Two-Tone, a song of obsession, of unrequited love for a girl named Jenny whose number was found on a bathroom wall. Eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. Eight six seven. I put my ear toward the radio. I heard it again, a startlingly familiar series of numbers. This was a local telephone exchange. And not just a local exchange, but the one in my own neighborhood. Everyone I knew in the blocks surrounding my house had a number that started with an eight, and most of them started with that very one, eight, six, seven. Somebody had written a song about where I lived. And it was a good song, and it was a hit. My slowly emerging sense of art suggested that the most important songs were about real life experiences, which was why everyone seemed so crazy about Bruce Springsteen, because everyone who listened to him literally had a hungry heart, and could therefore relate personally to his lyrics. But now, remember I was 16 years old, there was a song about a real life experience that was not a familiar generalization. It actually referred to a specific aspect of my own life experience. America was vast and fascinating in its every region, infinite in its telephonic numerology. And the writer of that song, who was from California, could have picked any exchange to represent any place, or could have picked 555-5309 to represent every place. But he didn't. This Jenny person could be living a block away. We knew what we had to do. <laughs> we went to the basement where a wall-mounted telephone was next to the washer and dryer, useful for teenage privacies. My older brother took his position as overseer, I lifted the receiver and dialed eight six seven five three zero oh, nine. Hello. I didn't have a lot of experience talking on the phone to girls, and so the notion of cold calling, and particularly someone famous, took all the nerve I could muster. Is Jenny there? It would be years before I learned the full truth of the song. The co-writer, Alex Hall, said in a 2004 interview that he was looking for a simple pop hook, and something about the rhythm and syntax of those numbers found a way more or less randomly through his imagination. Quote, Despite all the mythology to the contrary, I actually just came up with the Jenny and the telephone number and the music and all that just sitting in my backyard, he said. There was no Jenny. I don't know where the numbers came from. 
I was just trying to write a four chord rock song and it just kind of came out. I made it up under a plum tree in my backyard. Under a plum tree in California. This would suggest the meaningfulness to catchiness ratio was approximately that of a wop bop a boo bop a wop bam boom. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen would later write a song called Youngstown about the actual Youngstown with a love interest also named Jenny. It's a sad, sad song. Here in Youngstown, my sweet Jenny, I'm sinking down. The name was literal, drawn from local history, and is well known in that beleaguered city. Jenny was the town's nickname for the Jeanette Blast Furnace, part of a vibrant steel mill that shut down in 1977. Jenny sat rusting for two decades until its demolition in 1996, a year after Springsteen's song came out. This bold adherence to fact and emotional truth seemed almost like a makeup call from the songwriter community, but it was far too little and far too late for me. It took a while for the news to reach us, mostly because it wasn't really news so much as the opposite of news, but somehow that summer we learned there were 8675309s in other places, apparently lots of other places, and the one that was getting all the attention was the home phone number of the daughter of the Buffalo Chief of Police, who was pretty unhappy about the whole thing. <laughs> Which meant we were nobody again. We kept calling the local number from time to time because more than anything else, that's what teenage boys do. The same thing, over and over, expecting different results. But we never so much as stopped the satisfaction of being yelled at and soon we learned that even that part of the unraveling myth was not exclusively ours. Apparently everyone in the area code who owned a radio had thought of the same prank, and before long, the seven precious numbers resulted in three atonal beeps, followed by the sad, familiar refrain. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. If you feel you have reached this recording in error, please check your number and try the call again. So that's one tiny aspect of my own experience coming to a de self definition of place, which grew over the course of my life staying in the same place to a higher understanding and, and um, a broader understanding and a shared understanding because my friends and I, my family and I, we talk about these things and how they define who we are and where we are and, and what we are. But I'm also very aware that that definition has changed. My parents' sense of place is different than my sense of place, and now a new generation is defining its place. And so I guess if there's a, um, a sort of a walk-off um, suggestion that I would make to you as leaders is that you're in a position to inspire yourselves and your communities to create the new definition. It's changing, and I think we're at a point, a significant point of change. I think the fact that the, that the term Rust Belt has been in the national conversation in a lot of ways just in the past few years, and in a way that suggests that it's useful to define our authenticity, what we came from, the hardship we lived through, but also that maybe it needs a new, that, that a new one needs to, to come about. Um, but it can't be a catchy, glossy marketing catchphrase. It can't be Cleveland, it's a plum. It needs to be something new that's real, that's understood but only by the people who are here and who've been here and who've been thinking about it. So that's your, your marching orders, is to defi define yourselves, inspire the people that you lead to define yourselves and, and continue the evolving definition. Thanks so much to Amex for having all of us here. This is a really great event and I appreciate it the way you're doing it. So, thanks, Jason.